We are going to be recording. I just want to let everybody know that. We just started recording and we want to welcome everybody to the Healthier Together workshop. Okay, my name is Christy Bruner and I'm the Community Engagement Supervisor with Healthy St. Pete and the City of St. Petersburg. Good morning and welcome to the second quarterly Healthier Together workshop. If you didn't join us back in January in person at the Foundation Building of Healthy St. Pete, we are glad that you're here with us virtually today. Today we have a wonderful panel of presenters here to share information about their field of expertise, how it relates to the mission of Healthy St. Pete, and also in response to COVID-19. Okay, just going to get here. And there we go, hi guys. First, a few housekeeping rules. Please mute your phones and turn off the video if you're not done so already. Please use the chat box feature at the bottom of the screen throughout the presentation. One of our community health leaders, Philip Belcastro, will be posting links that our presenters will reference throughout the presentation. Additionally, we will be sending out an email after the call outlining the resources shared and answering any additional questions. Please comment in the chat box with any specific questions and also please mention who the question is for and we will work on getting answers to those at the end of the presentation. I would like to introduce our speakers today. We have with us Deputy Mayor Dr. Kanika Tomlin. We have our Parks and Rec Director Lynn Gordon. We have Wendy Wesley with the St. Pete Free Clinic. Cassidy Mnansky, one of our planners and health in all policies. We have Justin McLean with Home Again Counseling and also myself, Community Engagement Supervisor with Healthy St. Pete's. We're gonna turn it over to Deputy Mayor, Dr. Kanika Tomlin to give us a welcome and some information this morning. All right, take it away. Hi everyone, how are you? I am uh, so happy to be here with you today virtually. It's a reminder for our community that although we are separated, we are never apart. I hope that everyone is healthy and well and uh, has been able to find a ray of hope in our figurative sunshine that separates our city from so many in our community, in our world overall. Uh, thank you for all that you have been doing to help our city navigate through this trying and difficult time. Uh, we are in the first steps of our journey back to uh, recovering uh, St. Pete to its pre-COVID state, and we know that it will take the effort of all of us and the cooperation and collaboration. So again, thank you for what you've done for that to date, and thank you for all that you will do. I am Dr. Kanika Tomlin. I am the Deputy Mayor and City Administrator of our beautiful city of St. Petersburg. In that role, I basically serve to extend the reach of Mayor Kreisman so that we can have an appropriate and adequate impact on all 270,000 of the residents who call St. Pete home. A big part of that role every day is translating intent into action as we pursue our vision. And as it relates to our uh, work today, I wanted to just touch base on the purpose and vision behind Healthy St. Pete, how we got started and why it's so important and to reinforce uh, the role of collaboration and uh, cooperation between all of us because Healthy St. Pete is an important idea, but it is all of you and the many people throughout our community who breathe life into it that make it an impactful reality. So Healthy St. Pete, as you know, is an empowerment and engagement um, initiative for our community that's designed to help us live, shop, eat, and play healthier. When Mayor Kreisman invited me to join his team in the role of Deputy Mayor back in uh, November of 2013, I worked as a healthcare executive. And uh, I was very excited as a lifelong resident of St. Pete at the opportunity to give back to the community in such a significant way, uh, but knew that it was the work that uh, I was doing in partnership with so many real heroes in healthcare was too important to leave behind. And so one of my first questions to Mayor Kreisman prior to accepting his invitation was, did he see in his vision for the city a place for health to become 
uh, a preeminent priority uh, that guides the way we unfold quality of life for our citizens. And he did. And that really was the birthplace of Healthy St. Pete. Uh, our work together to create a culture of health uh, that is filled with sustainable solutions and innovations that help us in all of our overarching goals. And Healthy St. Pete uh, really works through those four areas of impact, as you know, uh, in very meaningful ways. It's an intersection between policy and practice uh, with a focus on sustainable solutions. And that manifests in many ways uh, from health and all policies uh, to our focuses on fitness and healthy choices and uh, helping our uh, communities, residents really optimize their vision for themselves and their personal lives. The city doesn't have any formal responsibility or authority as it relates to the provision of health care. So for us, it's really about creating a culture of health empowering our community uh, in meaningful ways that supplement the great work of partners. Many of you who are on this call, uh, many we meet every day who are doing the work to advance health in our community. We could not do it without our community and without collaboration uh, and bright ideas and thoughts and commitment of uh, everyone who touches Healthy St. Pete. So thank you to you. Thank you to our Healthy St. Pete team uh, that works in amazing ways every day to extend our reach and make a difference. Thank you, Christy. Thank you so much, Deputy Mayor. We appreciate your time this morning. Wonderful. We're going to turn it over now, maybe, <laughs> to our Parks and Recreation Manager, Lynn Gordon. Good morning and thank you, Christy. Uh, in a, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> pardon me, a previous slide, she credited me with being the Parks and Recreation uh, Director. I'm not there yet, uh, but I am a very proud manager uh, in Parks and Recreation. I um, <clears throat> have been with Parks and Recreation for about six years, but I'm a very proud 17 year employee of the city of St. Petersburg. And uh, this is an exciting time uh, for us as we've seen um, Healthy St. Pete grow over the last, I believe we're in year five now. So it's really exciting and I'm, I'm so excited um, and thankful to be a part of uh, Healthy St. Pete as their manager. Um, and Healthy St. Pete is a gem within the city's operations and I am so proud of the work that um, we do and so thankful for the staff um, headed by um, Kim Lado, who's our Healthy St. Pete coordinator, along with Christy and the other staff that we have, many of whom are on the call with us this morning as well. So uh, I, I have to share that point of pride that I was uh, chosen to, uh, to manage them, but they pretty much run themselves and they do it oh so well. So kudos to, uh, to Christy, who is a bright and shining star within our organization and uh, is just doing wonderful, wonderful things. So I'm here this morning uh, virtually in my home office to talk to you all, you all about um, uh, faith-based partnerships. Um, so Healthy St. Pete is excited and proud of the partnerships that we've cultivated over the years. We've made so much progress, but as we know, there's always work to be done. <clears throat> And we rely on each of you on this call and others to help us accomplish that work. One segment of our community that we strongly wish to uh, reach and have a stronger impact is within our faith-based community. Of course, partnerships with faith-based organizations are nothing new, but we in St. Healthy St. Pete have a strong desire to incorporate it into the fabric of the culture of health that we are working hard every day to elevate. Now remember that faith-based organizations are often the first point of contact for individuals who need guidance and resources. Uh, with that in mind, faith-based organizations need to be equipped to meet those needs. And many of you that are on this call with us today are uh, trusted advocates, subject matter experts, healthcare, mental and physical healthcare practitioners, and just community folks who have a servant heart um, that have so much to offer our very large faith-based community. We have churches, temples, mosques, and other places of worship 
both large and small, regardless of the geographic location and diversity of members that stand to benefit from valuable partnerships. Uh, there are many benefits of partnering and collaborating with a faith-based community, and I'd like to highlight a couple of those, kind of to get your wheels thinking today as to what we can do, what you can do as our partners with us to help us elevate our presence in the faith-based community. Resources from partners like you all can help us expand our coverage and intervention and treatments, uh, which as practitioners and our subject matter experts know, um, you understand how important it is to grow the pool of resources and reach various segments of the population. And when possible, this allows us to take preemptive action so that we don't end up um, um, fighting for our lives or fighting for our health or fighting for our community in many cases. Secondly, collaboration through education can uh, help create a sense of legitimacy in the eyes of the community. This feeling of legitimacy helps dispel rumors and myths and fosters trust um, among those providing these valuable services and partnerships. Trust is such a large part of building partnerships as many times community members look to their faith-based leaders, uh, clergymen and other well-respected members of the community for guidance on who they should trust and what information is in fact trustworthy. Next, cross-sector engagement and collaboration. Diversity is one of the most beautiful things about our city and our society. Partnerships and collaborations open the door for others to see the points of view of someone who's different from them. It helps um, see uh, views about needs and perceptions, and this is critical in reaching a wide range of faith-based organizations. The goal should be working towards achieving the shared desire of overall wellness, regardless of religious affiliation or religious beliefs. I know from personal experience at my church, um, I attend church on um, 18th Avenue South, Faith Memorial Missionary Baptist Church, <clears throat> that there is a great interest in benefiting and connecting with the valuable resources that you, our partners, can offer. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, we're fortunate at my church to have a health and wellness ministry. Um, I believe one of our uh, ministry members is on the call with us this morning, uh, Lisa Vinson. And um, Lisa and the health and wellness ministry work with other ministries at our church, our women's ministry, our brotherhood ministry, and a few others to um, uh, host our biggest and what I think is our best event uh, twice a year. And that event is a closed closet and health fair. So we go into the community at a vacant lot across the street from our church. We have free clothes and toiletries to anyone in need, no questions asked. And we also uh, welcome mental uh, health professionals. We uh, welcomed uh, Pinellas County Department of Health, social services providers, uh, and even the Bay Care Faith Community Nursing Program. Um, uh, our church has a, a partnership with the Faith um, Community Nursing Program um, who have conducted diabetes workshops, blood pressure checks at our church, and we receive uh, periodic communications from them about bits of information that we can share with our congregation. <clears throat> like our church, many other churches have uh, health-related ministries and, uh, or some variation of that to serve their members and their surrounding community. And I'm sure that they would all welcome assistance from folks like you all on this call uh, to uh, further their reach, to increase their impact, and to better serve their congregations, their worshipers, and the surrounding community. So how can you, our valued partners, help us? Clearly, each of you has a heart for service and helping others, and this is your call to action. Please give thought to how you can think outside of the box and reach our faith-based community members. So with that in mind, I'm going to quickly ask if anyone has any ideas, if you'd like to put in the chat box um, um, to share with us, if you have some out of the box thoughts that you uh, would like to share, or if you've already been a part of something that's kind of out of the box, um, please share that with us in the chat box. 
and we will, um, Christy, is, as she said, we're going to be saving this chat and uh, we will do some information sharing. It's so important that uh, this information not just stay here within this group, but it gets out to our very large community. So here's some ideas that uh, came to my mind as to how you all can help. Um, I know we have some community garden enthusiasts on the call, or at least I believe we probably do, because who doesn't love a good community garden? Um, I would encourage community garden enthusiasts to consider how you can partner with a local place of worship to start a gardening plan. That gardening plan can benefit not just the members of that place of worship, but perhaps it becomes a place that becomes a true community gathering place, a true place where they can serve not just their members, but other members of the community as well. I know we have some exercise enthusiasts on the call this morning. So if our exercise enthusiasts can think, how can I reach out to a faith-based organization? Maybe we can offer Zumba classes. Maybe we can offer line dancing classes. Maybe we can offer yoga classes, something that is going to engage not just, again, not just the members of a particular place of worship, but anyone who may be interested uh, in, in wellness. Uh, I know the goal of many churches, many places of worship is not just to stay inside the four walls of their place of worship, but to reach the community. Um, also, we have mental and physical health practitioners who can offer valuable services and resources, such as uh, being support group facilitators, uh, health advisors, health educators, and health referral agents to many, many, many folks who may not know where to turn. So as we know, community members often go to their places of worship as a first line of resources, but our places of worship may not know exactly where to point someone for a need that they have. So if you all will accept our call to action today, think outside of the box, reach out to us, figure out where you can be most beneficial to our faith-based community. We would be so grateful for that. Um, how can you further use your time and your talents to help all of our citizens reach and enjoy the optimal health that we all deserve? Thank you, Christy. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Lynn, for all of that wonderful information. And I love the connection of how people in the community can really get involved and that everybody has a voice to help the, the community collaborate together. So thank you so much. We are going to toss it over to Wendy Wesley now with the St. Petersburg Free Clinic and she's going to give us some great ideas. As you can see from her profile picture, she's been doing some amazing YouTube videos that she's going to tell us about and giving some great opportunities for the community. So let's turn it over to Wendy. Hi. Hi, good morning. I'm Wendy Wesley. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist, and I'm the health education manager for the St. Petersburg Free Clinic. And um, we have been busy during um, our quarantine, during um, our COVID-19. And uh, especially, I'm sure you've seen on social media with our food pantry. Um, we took the food pantry outside and not just at our location down by Mirror Lake, but also um, all over the city with some mobile kind of emergency food pantries. So um, uh, I just wanted to share a couple of quick stats, and this is uh, about our health, our health center, our clinic, and also about our um, food pantry. Since the, um, the uh, COVID-19 quarantine started in, middle, in the middle of March, we fed um, over 25,000 people in the city of St. Petersburg through our um, food pantry. And we, like I said, we took it outside and we have a drive-through food pantry. You may have seen it on the news or may have seen it on social media. So people um, drive, drive up and we have volunteers who uh, load food into their trunks and their back seats and off they go and they can come to us once a month. We also took our pantry uh, to North St. Pete and then also into South St. Pete with some of our emergency and mobile food pantries. Um, since the quarantine started, we have distributed 2.3 million pounds of food through our food bank, which is um, almost a 300% increase over what we typically do during this period of time. So we have seen a lot of people who are new to us 
um, hundreds and hundreds of families who have never ever come through our food pantry before and they are brand new to us. Um, and through those mobile food pantries, we've served over um, 2,000 children and adults in just um, a short period of time. And that's from the mobile sites, not from our main site. And then our health clinic has remained open as well. And we have switched to a telehealth model and we have served 160 patients through, our, through the phone and getting them uh, vital medication like uh, diabetes medication, insulin. Um, and we also provide telehealth. And so as we slowly open up our health clinic again, we are going to dedicate two rooms just to um, telehealth. And so we've really been able to harness some interesting and new um, technology to the free clinic. I think these are all things that we always intended to do, but the, um, the, the um, quarantine and the, the COVID-19 kind of forced our hand to um, adopt some of this technology sooner than later. So um, as they say, in crisis opportunity, right? Um, let's see. We continue to provide emergency housing for homeless families, homeless men and homeless women through our shelters. And uh, volunteers have been coming to us, our, our, our uh, established volunteers. But since the, um, the COVID-19 quarantine started, we have trained and engaged 75 brand new volunteers. And so we have more volunteers today than we ever have. And there's, we have a waiting list of volunteers who want to get involved with the St. Pete Free Clinic. So what I did when this started was I said, how can I continue to reach out and uh, meet people's needs for cooking? Because a lot of us were staying home. A lot of us had a bit more time on our hands. Of course, maybe restaurants were closed or perhaps we had limited income to feed ourselves. So I took cooking classes online. And so I have a, um, uh, the free clinic has always had a YouTube channel. So I said to my boss, I said, can I go into the kitchen and cook and talk about nutrition and will, can we upload it to YouTube? And the answer was yes. And so they've um, uploaded my videos to YouTube and uh, I think there'll be a link um, uh, included with this meeting of how you can go and watch those. And so those will be there forever. One thing I've learned is that I'm going to continue with online education, even after the health center opens um, and we're back up to doing uh, teaching instruction in the kitchen and nutrition lessons in the teaching space. Um, I'm going to continue to find ways to um, offer everything I do virtually. And because I realize not everyone can can drive up to our health center and come to our teaching kitchen. So um, I'm, this has been an interesting time and I've, I've uh, really learned to harness a lot of new technology and I intend to continue with all of it. So it, I'm pretty excited with about it. Also, and then for the last um, five, not five Tuesdays, we've had a 530 p.m. Um, health education class online with Zoom. And it's been about um, managing expectations, meditation, and it's all a bit, it's been about uh, managing worry, things that have to do with your mental health. And we'll continue with that every Tuesday night at 5.30, um, an online Zoom class. So you just kind of log on and, and uh, pay attention. We have some of our volunteers who are experts in the health field who offer this um, kind of education. And it's been about um, managing expectations and mental health. And so that's been very good during this period of time of of worry. Um, well, that's what I have as far as a, uh, a, an update from the free clinic. And if I have time, I can do just a quick little, yeah, nutrition lesson. So I understand that, um, you know, we're home and some of us may be um, on the couch a bit watching television. And sometimes with that comes mindless snacking. And that can uh, certainly exacerbate um, our conditions of heart disease with uh, high sodium snacking and also diabetes, uh, to sna snacks tend to be kind of low fiber, high carbohydrate snacks. And I have picked one that is um, a favorite of my son and it's uh, goldfish crackers. And so if you turn it over and you look at the serving size of the goldfish cracker, the serving size is 55 pieces. Well, to be quite frank, I don't know what 55 little goldfish look like. So my recommendation to you is that if you have a favorite snack, you go ahead and you figure out what that portion is and find a snack bowl that you are going to use consistently. So you, this one time or two times, you measure out exactly what the food manufacturer has said is your um, allotted snack size or portion size, and you put it in a bowl. So here I have a snack bowl 
and I pledge to use the same snack bowl um, when I portion these out for me and my son. So here is here are 55 goldfish. So if you ever wanted to know what 55 goldfish looks like. So every time I measure out my snack, I'm going to use my same snack bowl and I'm going to eyeball it. I'm not going to count out 55 goldfish uh, every time, but see now I have a visual and I know how much my serving size is. So that's my recommendation is have a consistent snack bowl and really know what your serving size is. You cannot change what you don't acknowledge. So here's the truth. Here's 55 goldfish. Now you know. And so that goes for anything you're snacking on a cookie or um, uh, ice cream. Um, you know, serving size of a pint of Ben and Jerry's is only a quarter of it, <laughs> technically, not the whole thing. So um, again, paying attention to snack sizes and also paying attention to um, mindless snacking while setting it, sitting in front of the television. This is a great uh, trick to keep your portions sane. And that's all I have. I appreciate um, you inviting me and I appreciate being an ambassador for Healthy St. Pete. It's been my honor and joy. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Wendy. Those are amazing ideas. And thank you so much for letting us know what the free clinic is doing right now and how people can get involved. So okay. we really appreciate your time today. Great. Excellent. We are going to go to our next speaker. Uh, Healthy, uh, Healthy St. Pete's Health in All Policies Planner is Cassidy Matnansky. She is on our Healthy St. Pete team. Let me find Miss Cassidy and we will get her started. Cassidy, there she is. Hi everyone. Um, <laughs> that was really good advice and I need to do that with tortilla chips like, <laughs> immediately because <laughs> that's my snack food of choice and I know I probably snack on that more than anything. Um, so as Christy mentioned, I'm the health and all policies planner for the city. Um, my email address is in the chat box I just noticed. So if you have any questions. Um, so first off, the one sentence overview of health and all policies, which I could talk for hours about, but was told not to, um, for all of your benefits. So health and all policies allows us to promote policies, programs, projects, and plans that create a supportive environment so that everyone can live their healthiest life, which is essentially health equity. And we take that social determinants of health approach to look at the downstream impacts, uh, the health impacts of our policy decisions. And, and through this, we can identify ways that we can better promote health, um, essentially so that healthy public policy becomes the normal way of doing business. If you want more information on health and all policies and how to get involved, uh, reach out to me. And then uh, Phil is gonna put our website, um, Healthy St. Pete's website has a landing page for health and all policies with our most recent um, health impact assessment report. And then we also have the FDOH's uh, Florida Department of Health website that talks more about the larger Pinellas County Health and All Policies Collaborative um, that we have with, uh, the city, with the city of Pinellas Park, Pinellas County, um, and the Foundation for a Healthy St. Pete. Um, another thing, so I'm going to talk about two different things today uh, about what I've been up to um, for during this time and what we've been up to as a Healthy St. Pete staff. So one of the things I wanted to mention is that we have started a COVID-19 um, response called the St. Pete Cares Work Group um, at the direction of the deputy mayor. And it's not just healthy St. Pete staff, we're actually collaborating as a multi-departmental working group. Um, and that working group is essentially looking at how can we support our community during this difficult time and how do we keep them engaged with the city? So we really look at um, different resources for our most vulnerable communities. We kind of have a whole resource database um, we look at where there's where we realize that there's resource gaps and we kind of find ways to take action. A lot of that results in us brainstorming outreach strategies that we share across de departments, identifying opportunities where we can collaborate. Um, and so some of those resources that we've identified have actually been put on the city's web pages, um, which are in the chat box. Things about food supply, um, including the St. Pete Free Clinic, um, small business support, different social services organizations. Um, they're all on the St. Pete website and the uh, city's greenhouse website. The other thing I wanted to mention that we've been working on, and it was announced a little bit at our last work, uh, Healthy Saint Pete, uh, Healthier Together workshop back in January, is the Healthier Together certification. So um, even though it's been a difficult time, we're still working on getting that out there. So what it is, for those who weren't present during the last workshop, is the Healthier certifi uh, Together certification will recognize St. Petersburg businesses, neighborhoods, faith-based community groups, uh, nonprofits, schools, 
um, for their outstanding efforts in contributing to creating a healthy environment for our community. And currently we've been working on developing the question sets, the application for both neighborhoods and businesses. And we're really striving to include evidence-based health and wellness principles that are achievable and relevant to our St. Pete businesses. So we're really referencing existing tools that are out there from um, the federal government, from nonprofits um, that are already evidence-based. We're looking at the health literature, we're looking at guidebooks, and we're thinking through about, well, what does this mean for St. Pete? What's most relevant and achievable for St. Pete? So we've been working on developing those. Um, the question sets that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the concepts that are in them, but the question sets will really help participants, businesses, neighborhoods, whoever, to evaluate their existing policies and programs and even their built environment, such as the building for a business or the neighborhood itself, and how those promote wellness, how they can encourage the adoption of healthy behaviors, and essentially how do they help create that healthy and supportive community. And Christy will provide more information when she talks about the business side, um, about altogether the Healthier, same, uh, Healthier Together certification, but I know we're planning on sharing best practices and resources to program participants. Um, in regards to the neighborhood certification, which I'm currently working on, um, currently collaborating with Christy to develop and Susie Ahawk, our community services director. Um, we actually already have some early adopters, even though we don't have the tool out, we have neighborhoods saying, well, how can we be healthy? And so we started our neighborhood wellness champion um, through Healthy St. Pete. And we actually have already adopt, uh, have four different uh, neighborhoods, Coquina Key, Greater Grovemont, Eagle Crest, and Shore Acres that have, uh, have, <laughs> have adopted a, um, a neighborhood wellness champion. And some of those neighborhood wellness champions uh, pro at least prior to COVID-19, they were starting to do a neighborhood walk every Saturday as part of the Get Fit, uh, Get Fit program. And they were starting to look at what are the other things that they can do. Um, so that's still out there. We're still collaborating with them. Um, and we gave them an award at the uh, annual neighborhood awards from the, from the mayor this year. And hopefully next year, the neighborhood awards will also be tied together with this Healthier Together certification program. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about what you can expect um, that question set to look like or what topics you can expect, uh, particularly for neighborhoods. So you might find in this um, question set and this these resources, those very stereotypical topics when we think about health. So physical activity, what is your neighborhood doing to promote physical activity? Maybe it's that neighborhood walking group that we were talking about, or maybe it's you participate as an organized sports team um, in a league and you are representing your neighborhood in that league. Um, in this era of social distancing, when we don't really have organized sports teams currently practicing, there's still solutions and we're looking at, well, what can we add to this as options for promoting physical activity for neighborhoods? So right now it's bike month. And so we've seen um, across the nation, a lot of different neighborhood associations and community uh, groups are tracking their miles on the Let's Ride website as a team and trying to achieve, oh, we wanna achieve a thousand miles with our entire um, team or, oh, we're gonna create a neighborhood competition to see who gets the most miles. We've also seen even here in St. Petersburg for promoting physical activity, I think it was the Magnolia Heights neighborhood for um, the Easter holiday, they did an egg hunt, but obviously they didn't want to be near each other or touch the eggs. Um, so they actually put large eggs in the windows of various neighborhood residents and people went around and took photos of those eggs to prove that they had found the eggs. And those are the creative solutions that we're looking for is how can you still promote health during this time. We're also gonna, as I mentioned, with health and all policies especially, we look at those upstream, um, imp, uh, upstream causes of health. And so we're thinking about social cohesion and supportive networks, the supportive social networks, and what does your neighborhood association do for that? And we know our neighborhood associations, a lot of them are already doing great activities and we wanna provide recognition for them and also let them have an, a way to collaborate and come up with ideas together. Um, of how they can promote health. So maybe neighborhood associations are volunteering together and they adopt their local elementary school and they all mentor for one day a week or one day a month. Maybe they, as a group, participate in Heart Walk or another charity walk run together. Maybe they have an event like a hay ride for the fall and they make sure it's age friendly so that everybody can participate because that's a big thing is how do you get people to participate and how are you inclusive of your diversity of your neighborhood? And that's also on that topic, a big question is, 
when you're at your neighborhood association meeting, when you're making neighborhood plans, when you're having neighborhood events, how are you making sure that you can involve everybody in your neighborhood and that they feel comfortable coming? And I have to say that a lot of times we talk about youth engagement and how do we get kids and teens and the, uh, the Gen Zs to come. And then a lot of times we talk about um, age friendly and the elderly, but how are you engaging every demographic in between? Are you getting millennials to come and talk about what they imagine their neighborhood to look like with you? Are they at the table? Um, with COVID-19 for that social cohesion and supportive networks, We've seen um, some various awesome ideas coming out of different neighborhoods. We've seen um, essentially like a neighbors helping neighbors where different neighborhood associations help to organize those that are more vulnerable in their neighborhood that can't really go out to the grocery store right now that don't, that are, you know, they just can't. And so they're finding neighbors to go buy their, you know, go get the groceries for them and bring them back or go get that toilet paper that they just could not find. Um, we've seen some people talk about phone trees um, and this is something that can go beyond co uh, this current era is how are you checking on your senior residents um, more regularly? Do you have some type of adopt a, adopt a grandparent program? That's an, or how are you also making sure that everyone has access right now to your neighborhood association meetings? So we saw the Child's Park neighborhood actually hosted their neighborhood association meeting on Zoom this month and they had to make they made sure that everybody understood how to use zoom even people who were not very familiar with the technology so that was cool to see um, the neighborhood association president trying to figure that out and then one last topic that you might see on this tool and there's quite a few of them um, but my personal favorite is the built environment and how does the um how does your how does your neighborhood association help contribute to a healthier built environment so what's your role in that and it kind of gets into the advocacy role of, well, if there's bike lanes and neighborhood greenways in your neighborhood, um, are you promoting them to your residents? Do they know where those bike routes are? Do they know where the safe sidewalks and walking trails nearby are? Um, and also, are you advocating to the city and working with the transportation department to make those neighborhood transportation plans? Are you helping to identify safety hazards and speaking up when you're like, this traffic's too fast? Or, you know, the sidewalk's not perfect right now. Let's report it through C Click Fix and make sure that we can get it fixed. And then some other creative ideas on that is working on your own properties collectively. So I saw this one case study, and I would love to be part of this personally, where a bunch of different neighbors decided to all plant butterfly gardens in their front yards. And then all of a sudden, the whole neighborhood became like a butterfly garden. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have some ideas related to tactical urbanism. And obviously, I can explain what that is through examples, but you always want to check with the city and talk to um, the community services department or the correct department to see what's permissible. But some examples from across the United States is like putting some temporary chalk down to paint or to encourage people to slow down you know, when they're going too fast to draw attention with the, with the chalk or creating, I've seen um, some neighborhoods recently um, with coronavirus because there's less cars on the roads, they've created temporary bike lanes and the, the neighborhoods are like, we think we want a bike lane here, but we're not sure. Could we do something temporary? Um, when I lived in Tallahassee, we did an event once where we did pocket parks in on-street parking. We set up a mini park and had some games. Um, cornhole wasn't a thing then, but we had different games and we got everybody together and it was a good social event. And we collaborated with the neighborhood and the city and kind of talked about, well, what could we do here? Um, so there's a lot of different things that are going to go in this tool and it's going to also lead to some idea sharing. You might even get ideas from the tool itself. So we're excited. Um, I'm enjoying doing the research on it and um, I'm looking forward to when we are able to collaborate on that with all of you, um, especially the neighborhood association. So I'm going to pass it off back to Christy, um, but thank you all for being here today. It's great to see everybody's faces and no names at least. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cassidy. I hope everybody notices your pelican earrings. Go St. Pete. <laughs> Those are adorable. Thank you so much, Cassidy, for all that information. And as we mentioned before, please post your questions, your ideas, your resources, um, and ways that we can further collaborate in the chat box. We're going to hand it over now to Justin McLean with Home Again Counseling. Uh, he is a local mental health provider and he has some great ideas uh, for us today. Let me see, there's Justin. All right, there's Justin. Welcome, Justin. Hey guys, happy Friday. I hope everyone's doing well. 
Um, so this has been a real tough time uh, for a lot of folks. You know, this, is, this has been a crazy time. You know, we've never seen or experienced anything like this. Um, this is a real unique time. Um, so stress is on the rise, you know, but responsibilities haven't gone anywhere. Um, people still have to uh, live somewhere. People still have to eat. Um, parents are still parenting. Kids are still having to go to school. Um, and things still have to be washed and chores still have to be done. Um, so one of my uh, topics, one of the things that I use, or before I go into a topic um, or a technique that I use, I forgot to really introduce myself. I'm Justin McLean, uh, therapist at Home Again Counseling. I work with uh, teens and adults um, and doing individual counseling, uh, family counseling, and group counseling. In our practice, we also specialize in trauma-focused counseling also. Uh, we're located right by Wendy, at, uh, by Mirror Lake, um, right across the street from the library. Um, and all of our sessions now, though, are being done on using Zoom and other um, platforms, uh, telemental health. So, and then my background also is I have worked for the Pinellas County Schools for four years. And I also was work, I worked with kids in therapeutic foster care for four years. Um, and I also train other therapists in working with um, traumatized children in the foster care system. So I have that experience. And I'm also a community advocate. I volunteer with CASA. Um, if, if anyone know, doesn't know what CASA does, we work with uh, survivors of domestic violence. And another thing that I do in the community is I'm actually part of the Leadership St. Pete class uh, with Christy. Um, so that's been a great experience also. So going back to one of the best, uh, a technique that I use. So with, with this coronavirus, stress is on the rise, you know, like we're, and then that comes with feelings of anxiety, feelings of depression, or even feelings of anger. One of the things that I use is a grounding technique. Um, it helps me control my thoughts and my worries and, and sometimes like those, um, sometimes painful memories um, by refocusing on the present moment. And then I think we're gonna show it on the slide and we'll go with, um, so you guys can see and follow along. So it's the five, four, three, two, one technique. Um, so what are five things that you can see? You know, look for small details, you know, such as a pattern on ceiling, you know, the light coming from the window or um, things on the floor. I know my dog's over there so I can see her um, and kind of like, even focusing on like, hey, I, I look at her um, fur and things like that, things that I normally wouldn't focus on. The next one is four things that you can feel, such as how your clothes feel on your body, um, the temperature in the room. I'm kind of hot right now. <laughs> um, the feeling of sitting down on the chair or even my feet on the floor. Then you focus on three things that you can hear. You know, um, pay special attention to the, the sounds. Right now I have a sound machine that I use because I'm at my home. Uh, that's what I use during my therapy session, so I can hear that. Um, I can hear um, I can hear birds outside of my window, um, and of course. So, and then the next thing is two things that you could smell. Um, right now, I can't really smell much. Uh, I, oh, actually, I can smell my coffee still. Um, but things focusing on like a if you have a, can a candle in the room or any flowers and if you're doing this outside like grass uh, things like that and then the last one is focusing on something that you can taste uh, that could be a piece of gum candy um, like I said I love coffee so uh, probably take a sip of coffee in a minute and pay attention to those flavors you know and really like hold it in your mouth so that's something I definitely use. And I also put on some um, other, uh, there was something done by Headspace. I know Wendy brought it up with uh, meditation, but Headspace is offering free meditation, uh, meditation audios on their website. And the link should be listed below. 
and they're also doing free uh, service to their app for healthcare providers and educators also. So that's a great thing. Um, and then transitioning into the next one, like say if those feelings of depression or anxiety or anger get to be a little too much, um, there's counselors out there, there's, there's help, there's professionals out there. And I actually, there will be another link for a guide on how to help finding a therapist. So finding a therapist is, is extremely difficult. Uh, tons of folks come to me and say, hey, you know, since I'm in the field, they ask me, you know, do you know a therapist, things like that, because I've been trying to find one and I just can't, you know, it's so overwhelming. So the guide that I, the link for is going to really help you and make that process a little easier. And because there's tons of different directories in, in the Tampa Bay area on how to find folks, it's, there's going to be ways to teach you figuring out, hey, how to pay for a therapist, how to, you know, use insurance, and there's um, employee assistance plans for folks. Um, and I know there's also a lot of people that have lost their jobs during this time too. So there's also low cost options available. Um, so, and then from on the chat box, there was also a lot of different resources like NAMI is a great resource, local resource, the healthy lifestyles of Tampa Bay folks, um, they posted their link and I'm open. Um, my email is posted somewhere if anyone else needs some guidance on how to find some resources. Uh, so what was, oh, and another low cost option, it's free, a uh, community provider here in Pinellas, Directions for a Living. They actually have a emotional support call line that you can call Monday through Sunday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So that, that's a resource that's, up, that's out there for uh, people that are having a hard time with things. So that's about it. And if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to post it in the chat. And then or email me. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you so much, Justin. We appreciate those resources. That was a great um, technique as well to put in perspective of something that we can do anywhere at home and maybe even share it with our kids to share, yes. <laughs> share that uh, stress relief and anxiety relief with them as well. So we appreciate mm -hmm. that. Excellent. And please, like we mentioned, um, feel free to keep sharing resources, check back through for all the websites we've, we've uh, talked about and post any questions to any of the speakers that we've had today. So we're gonna end uh, with me, as I mentioned, uh, I am the Community Engagement Supervisor with Healthy St. Pete and the City of St. Petersburg. Let's see, there I am, hi guys. So at our last Healthier Together workshop in January, I introduced the Healthier Together initiative and it's three different phases. The first phase is our Healthier Together Ambassador Program and some of the people that you heard from today are our previous ambassadors. A few of our most recent ambassadors, and I think some of these guys might be on the call as well, um, include Keisha Benson, formerly with the Thrive by Five Pinellas, and now with the Foundation for a Healthy St. Petersburg. Ben Sawinski, Senior Planner with VHB, and Kristen Lewis with the American Heart Association. If you missed any of those ambassadors, the best way um, to find out some more information about them and also uh, find some more information about their organizations is to go to our Facebook group. Um, if you haven't joined that group already, uh, that link will come up in the chat box as well. But that's really the best way to find out what's going on with Healthy St. Pete and our best platform to be able to share those community resources with all of you. Our ambassadors represent their field of expertise and interact with Healthy St. Pete followers on our Facebook group. And if you or anyone you know might be a good ambassador for our future, please put your information in our chat box as well. We're looking for people that represent all different elements of wellness from children's health, environmental health, nutrition, um, all different elements that we want to represent there and fitness all through there. Uh, so in addition to that first phase, our second phase is the Healthier Together workshops, just like this one right here. Uh, they are quarterly workshops. So our first one was held in January. Our next one is scheduled for July 24th. That's the last Friday in July. So mark your calendars for that. That'll either be virtually or in person. We'll see how it goes um, at that point, but we do look forward to meeting again quarterly in July. Um, let's see, the purpose of these workshops is to share information and to discuss resources in our community and truly work together 
to improve health outcomes and reduce health inequities in our community. The third portion of this initiative is the Healthier Together certification that Cassidy introduced. At our last workshop, a focus uh, group, uh, focus of the event was to gather information about what was currently happening in workplaces and within organizations in the city. And if you were at that workshop, you know, we broke into some focus groups at individual tables and really got to know some information about what wellness related policies are in place, what resources are available, what's working, and where more help can be provided. So I want to pull up our, a, a little bit of information from that, uh, those focus groups. So these were some of the positives. Um, here's some feedback um, when the small groups were asked about what some of the positive reasons why organizations would want to implement wellness programming and resources at their organizations. So as you can see, uh, there were eight groups total. So you can see that the wellness offering a sense of belonging and encouraging healthy habits was important to a significant number of people. Those are those top two lines and all of the X's were the groups that um, mentioned that those things were important to them. Um, so if allocating more time and resources to wellness is so valuable to so many people, what would you say are some of the barriers? And we also went over that, but I just wanted to note some um, of the other positives. These are all things that people said were reasons why their neighborhood, their faith-based organization, their business would want to incorporate more wellness policy programming and procedures into what they're doing. And all of these are overwhelmingly positive, but we all know that there are barriers to doing all these things. Topping the list are awareness and education about wellness resources, as well as overall costs incurred. So our goal with the Healthier Together certification is to provide guidelines and parameters for ensuring organizations to have the tools to provide a healthy and safe environment for their employees, members, neighbors, clients, and associates. So as you can see, there's some things that are really true barriers here, maybe perceived barriers or actual barriers, but these are all things that we are looking to address as we put the finishing touches on this tool that Cassidy mentioned, both for the neighborhoods and for the businesses. And I know we had a question earlier about faith-based organizations and Lynn talked so much about that earlier. We're definitely looking to expand and to be able to offer this to other organizations such as nonprofits, faith-based organizations, um, schools, and different things like that. But we really want to make sure that the tool focuses in on the specific type of organization and has the most, um, uh, most appropriate uh, questions in there. Uh, going to do that. Hello. So the Healthier Together Business certification includes topics such as organizational commitment, community engagement, health promotion, and more. So what do those I'm different topics right mean? Organizational commitment is your leadership buy-in. How, um, how does your leadership feel about wellness programming, wellness policies? How important is that to your leadership and are they implementing those things to the best of their ability? Community engagement is something obviously I'm really passionate about and our organization is really passionate about. We want to ensure that um, we're, we're setting up parameters for uh, organizations, specifically businesses to say how they are contributing to their community with their base of knowledge. Um, whether they're a wellness provider, whether they are um, in a large business or even a small business, are they doing things like Cassidy mentioned? Are they doing heart walks. Um, one thing that I mentioned at our last meeting and I talked to different business owners about our walking meetings. That's something that we do with Healthy St. Pete. Um, is that an opportunity for your business or your team to have walking meetings or to incorporate healthier options um, into your celebrations and lunches and dinners together. So all those different things will be part of that tool um, in that healthier business certification. So when launched, the Healthier Together certification, both for neighborhoods and businesses, will offer an opportunity to not only assess the current organization wellness offerings, but, and this is the important part, guidance and case studies about how to expand the offerings. 
So as Cassidy mentioned, we're really basing this tool off of other tools that already exist. Um, American Heart Association, World Health Organization, lots of different things, um, CDC have tools, but we want to make sure that we're providing the resources to improve whatever status your organization is at now. So not only saying you're at a silver status, congratulations, but how can I get to gold? How can I get to the next level? What can I implement? What are other organizations in my community doing right now that might work with my organization? So again, in the chat box or um, e email me or get a hold of us um, at any way, we would love to know what your organization is doing now and what specific resources you need for the future. We look forward to launching this third phase of the Healthier Together initiative later this year and encourage residents, business owners, community leaders to continue to offer feedback and ideas. So you can email me at christy.bruner at stpete.org. That's the best way to get in touch with me. And we look forward to hearing more about what your organization is doing and uh, getting feedback as we launch this uh, certification later this year. Now let's pivot and I would love to highlight some of the resources Healthy St. Pete is offering during COVID-19. We have a wonderful virtual programming channel on YouTube that is for all of St. Petersburg Parks and Recreation. And I think, oh, look at that, Philip just posted that up there. So definitely check out that channel. And these are some great resources for you and your family to be able to do at home. We filmed a first responder fitness series. So we partnered with the fire department and the police department to um, have some of their fire cadets and police detective join us in some short workout sessions that you can do from home. Um, and conditioning in some of the same ways that they do while they are preparing uh, to be our first responders, but fun and exciting things that you can do at home. So we have several of our first responder fitness series um, in that uh, virtual programming channel. We also have Philip, uh, uh, who is helping us with our chat box today. He um, is one of our community health leaders. He leads our Fresh Rec Stop program, and he's done a great job producing and creating some uh, food videos to teach you again, just like Wendy, how to teach, how to cook uh, some healthy, easy recipes at home that are fun for you and your family. So check out those videos on the channel as well. We also have some programming for kids. We produced a progressive relaxation video for kids, which is a great way for, to get kids to tune into their own body and to be able to relax. And we have a coloring book coming soon that will be posted in the next week that uh, features some of the sights and sounds that you might see around St. Petersburg parks. Kids can print it out and do it for themselves at home. And it also encourages physical activities. You're hopping, jumping, and skipping through those parks. Uh, we also partnered with the Therapeutic Recreation Division of Parks and Rec, and they posted a few videos regarding physical literacy. Um, so those are uh, working on some gross motor skills for children. And so there's some great fun ideas from our therapeutic recreation department on that virtual programming channel. Another way to check in with us um, and with some resources for COVID-19 uh, are on our Healthy St. Pete website. Uh, on that blog, we have a few recent submissions from our partners at Ultra Oakland Hospital. Um, about how to handle stress and anxiety for your kids at home. So those are some great ideas there. And we would always love uh, future partnerships. If any of uh, our partners on the call now or any of our community partners that we haven't worked with yet would like to submit information to us, definitely send me an email, get in touch with us um, via the website. We'd love to feature your content as well. That's part of what Healthy St. Pete is all about. Um, we call ourselves the umbrella of all of the health and wellness that is going on in St. Petersburg since we are such a resource rich community. We make our best effort to share those resources and to commit to wellness for our community. So for our next steps, as Cassidy mentioned, Healthy St. Pete is assisting with the St. Pete Cares Committee to pull together resources in response to COVID-19. And there's a section on that site with information on how to donate and volunteer. Please check there to find some great opportunities to give back to our community. We are still recruiting for neighborhood wellness champions, as she mentioned, 
please contact us if you're interested in taking a leadership role in your neighborhood. Also, as I mentioned, please join our group on Facebook if you haven't already and join the conversation daily. Again, mark your calendars for July 24th for our next Healthier Together workshop. And we're going to see if we have any questions, if anyone would like to post anything. I know we mentioned uh, the faith-based uh, portion of our Healthier Together certification. So we really appreciate your time today. If there's no other questions, we're gonna let you guys go a little bit early. And we thank you for your time. We look forward to continuing to serve the community with your partnership. And we want you all to stay safe and have a great weekend. Thank you.